Hey everyone, welcome into the Gridiron Show. Michael McQuaid here uh, on what's been another busy, busy week in the NFL. Coming out of week 13, going into week 14 of the season, there's always news in this league. It doesn't matter if you're through the season or outside the season. Absolutely delighted to be joined by my uh, longtime partner and friend, Mr. Jeff Reinbold. Jeff, uh, coming to us live from Hawaii, I believe, uh, going by the backgrounds. How are you doing, money? Good? I'm doing great, Michael. It's great to talk to you and it's great to be back with the fans in the UK. Great to see you, Jeff. And yeah, we are looking forward to hopefully ha- having you on our screens, both on the television and the radio, hopefully in the next few weeks. But for now, this will have to do. Um, Jeff, I don't want to go too much into week 13, but there is never a dull moment in this league, is there? Like, you know, I I, I know for you, there's never an off day for you, but at least on a Sunday, you maybe get more of a chance instead of, you know, working in college, but getting the chance to watch some of these games. Just just another great weekend in the league, man. Like that, that, that Burrow Mahomes game. We have another 10 years of that to watch. Um just so much that Miami San Fran game. I, I guess do you know what? We'll, we will start on the whole situation in San Francisco. Um Brock Purdy is now QB1. And I'm glad we could do this because at the time of recording, the Niners have not had the opportunity to pick up Baker Mayfield. He goes to the Rams. But more importantly, Jeff, news coming out as we speak. I'm recording this on a Tuesday night that Jimmy Garoppolo may not be done for the season. He could be out for six to seven to eight weeks, which means he could come back into the playoffs. Just, Just first off, what are your thoughts on how Brock Purdy performed at the weekend for the Niners? And then secondly, what are your thoughts there on like Jimmy G? And do you think, you know, surely if they get that deep, they'll stay with Brock Purdy and and maybe do like what the Patriots done back, back in the day and stay with the, well, not Mr. Irrelevant, but, but in Mr. Purdy's case, Mr. Irrelevant. What a journey he's had over the last few weeks. Yeah, it's been phenomenal. And it's just, a, again, a case in point, Neil, uh, I mean, Michael about, why it's so important for players to prepare because you say it all the time to them, you know, and I, all those years in pro football and, you know, it's the same thing in college football at every level of football, the backup has to prepare as the starter, because in this game, you know, we're not playing tennis. This isn't basketball. This isn't soccer. This is a violent game where people get hurt all the time. And you can go in one snap from backup to having to perform. And anybody that, you know, goes in is expected to play at a high level. And now the expectation for Purdy has diametrically changed from two weeks ago when nobody even knew who he was. He was, you know, Mr. You talk about Mr. Irrelevant. He was Mr. Anonymous. And now, you know, he's a great story. So I'm, I'm rooting for the kid because I love to see these kind of stories. You love to see the guy that, that, you know, comes in from you know the being a backup and all of a sudden he's thrust into the limelight and he and he just goes and plays and I think what I think will be interesting just like Mike White when he got thrust into the you know the Jets starting job in a different under different different circumstances but anytime a backup goes to be the starter particularly at quarterback he's going to be underneath the microscope and it's how he handles it emotionally I think is more important I think Mike White has passed the test with flying colors I mean to the point now where you're seeing his teammates actually wearing t-shirts, you know, in support of him, you know, which is, that's a, that's a big, big statement inside a football team. It's going to be a really interesting run in for the Jets. And I'll try and talk about that towards the end of this broadcast, Jeff, I, I, I will say on the Niners and, and the whole situation with the quarterback there, I'm really intrigued to see how Purdy plays because Talk about a supporting cast. That defense is superb. Christian McCaffrey, never mind you got Debo there, George Kittle. It's all there for him on a plate. Could you hypothetically see any situation in which you're, please God, sitting in London uh, around the middle to the end of January and uh, Jimmy Garoppolo comes in? Well, you never know. I mean, that's that's the great thing about football. You never know at, at every level of it and and you know, in, in all the iterations of it. You know, the thing that I think is important to understand with Brock Purdy, right? And he has, and you mentioned this, you alluded to this, you talk about his supporting cast. He just needs to manage the game. He needs to make a few throws and and the defense that has been so lights out for San Francisco all year will carry that football team. You know, 
go back to the, you know, the, the Ravens that were, you know, with a outstanding defense and couldn't figure it out offensively. And then all of a sudden Trent, Dilf, Trent Dilfer goes in the game and, you know, he didn't have to, he didn't have to win the game. He just had to manage the game. And uh, I think that's the case with Brock Purdy, hand the ball off to McCaffrey, get the ball in Debo's hands. You know, that's the, that's going to be their recipe for success. They're not going to go back, you know, change their MO, right? This is a team that's physical and will uh, beat you on the line of scrimmage on both sides of the football. Uh, They create turnovers and negative plays on defense. So what they have to eliminate offensively is those two things. They've got to keep the turnovers to a minimum, grind out wins, and not have negative football plays. If they can do that, I think there's no reason why the Niners can't continue on the roll that they're on right now. I'll talk about the other big news coming out in Tuesday, Jeff, in a second. But another big thing that happened within the last hour of us actually recording this is the the waivers hitting news. And we, we've talked about the Niners and the quarterback. And a lot of people thought that the Niners may have went in for Baker Mayfield. Kyle Shanahan was very coy on that. Turns out he goes to the Rams. And this is a relevant subject because, you know, it's hard. You know, you have to go back not that long, Jeff. This guy was number one pick. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget watching the guy live on Instagram when he was getting the phone call being picked. Like, that's it's not that long ago. Uh, he, there was a lot of talk when he went to Carolina about, you know, can he re, can he regain his form? There's a great article on the read optional by, by Ollie Connolly about Baker Mayfield's struggles in Cleveland. He didn't mm-hmm. have a chance and he did not show the level of form that he had pre injury in Carolina. Do you see any situation in which Sean McVay looks at the situation with his quarterback with uh, with Walford? Obviously, Matthew Stafford isn't going to play again this season. More than likely, it's not going to happen. What a change of fortune for the Rams, Jeff, going from winning the Super Bowl last year, challenging the year before to now having this situation. How does it play out now with Baker Mayfield? Tell me how it plays out, man. Well, I, I think that, that remains to be seen, but I think there's some positive reasons, uh, you know, for Baker in this deal. Number one, he's going to go to a coach that is an offensive head coach who understands, you know, what his limitations are. And that may be more important than what he actually does. Well, his, how do you mitigate his, his, the things that he doesn't do well? Uh, The concern that I have about Baker Mayfield, as you look at his career, Michael is yes he was the you know first pick and all that other stuff and you know but the bottom line is the team that drafted him number one gave up on him and then the team that took him from the team that gave up on him they gave up on him and that team you know is is struggling for good news the Carolina Panthers now obviously the Rams have had their challenges. This is going, this is going, I guess they guaranteed a losing season for the first time in a long time, certainly since McVay, McVay got there. But I think Baker Mayfield can bring some things to that offense. He is mobile. He does, you know, throw best when he's on the move or using play action. Those two things are staples of the Rams offense. The Rams are not a drop back, throw it team. They're a team that has to run it first, and when they run it well, it sets up the bootlegs in the play-action game. He has a better cast of players around him, certainly, than he's had in a long time with the Rams. The Rams are still a good football team. Now they're, you know, they obviously when as nicked up as they've been all year, it's been, you know, it's been tough, and they're in a tough division. But I do think that this is a positive step for the Rams because. You know, Wofford, you know, just not going to get it done for you. And and again, I'm not sure the Baker is either, but this is certainly better than the alternative. Time will tell, my friend. Time will tell. I'm I'm really intrigued to see how Baker does get on in LA because I'll never forget. I think it was the second week in August or around that time when the the, the whispers and the rumors started to come out of Matthew Stafford and the injury he had, and and McVeigh plays it down. You've got a situation where McVeigh, honestly, Jeff seems like he wanted to retire last year or he considered it. And it makes you think about the reaction that's had. It shows you, and this is something that the 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 German team picked up on, on their podcast this week, Jeff. And it's actually an interesting thing to ask, actually. You know, you've been in, in the CFL and seen a lot of success in your career at, at that level. Mm-hmm. 
going into the NFL, looking at the Rams, it's so difficult to actually win it and go back and try and win it again, isn't it? It's so difficult. And it's a reason why so many or so little teams have done it. And it's also a reason why nobody's ever done a flea peak. Um, that's what the German ones were looking at that, that, this week in, in their podcast. And it's it's incredible, Jeff, to actually look into it. But the, the Rams have had injuries. They've lost players. The, the value of certain players have went up. And it doesn't help either whenever McVeigh is getting... God knows how much money being thrown at them by Amazon or, or or a different TV outlet also. Well, you know, when you talk to coaches who have been there and done it, you know, in professional football and won a championship, the thing that is almost unanimous that they say is it's much tougher to get back than it is to get there. And there are so many reasons for that, Michael. First of all, the biggest reason is after you have the success, you now wear a target on your chest and everybody is trying to create a football team to beat you, right? Because you're the standard. So the rules in the National Football League are built so that there aren't dynasties, okay? They want every team. They love the first, worst to first saga, you know? They want every team to win a Super Bowl. And So the design of the salary cap, the design of the draft, the design of free agency, it's all built to give every team a fighting chance. And then on top of it, when you win, right, there is, you can, you can very quickly fall prey to a terrible, terrible disease. You want to talk about COVID or any of these pandemics. The pandemic after you win in pro football is called the success flu. And it is, it will run through your organization and kill you because everybody wants theirs. Everybody wants a raise. Everybody wants to take a bow. Everybody wants to be on Johnny, you know, the late night talk shows. Everybody wants to do music videos. Everybody wants the star, the, the, the bright light of it right? And there's not enough of that to go around. And so now you get a, a fractured football team comes to training camp with, with what we know as, or what we call the post Super Bowl hangover. And the next thing, you know, you get a couple injuries and here we are with the Rams having a situation, a season that we would have never forecast. It's insane. It's, it's just it's just mad, Jeff, and time will tell what happens in LA. I do want to go over one big topic before we do start to clean up here, and that is the Titans. I Look, I wasn't massively shocked, but I guess the timing of it was interesting. Week 14 uh, of the season, John you, you Robinson. talking about firing the general manager? Yeah, I mean, like, wow, man. Like, the guy had, he was, um, he never had a losing season, seven years in Tennessee. He led the, the Titans to back-to-back AFC South titles in 2020, 2021. Uh, highest, or the ninth highest winning percentage, 0.606. Um, clearly, you know, you've seen the reaction from Mike Vrabel on draft night whenever AJ Brown was traded. The timing is intriguing because it makes you think it couldn't just be with the whole AJ Brown thing in Philly at the weekend. Surely there must be a dynamic there between him and Vrabel and the the wider management group in that franchise. But I was just surprised that it happened in week 14 of the season for a Titans team that has, re- like, I know they haven't got to the promised land, but they have had relative success in his time there. That's what I was surprised about. Yeah, I, I think the timing is interesting and there really is no good time, right? I mean, it's disruptive to a franchise whenever you do it. And certainly I think when you look at this thing, the one thing that you would say or could say, Mike, is that by doing it now, they get a jump start on what direction they'll go with this off season, right? That obviously there was, there was some sort of challenge inside the building, some sort of power struggle inside the building. And let me say from this, from a guy who's been inside the building, right. In, in both the national football league and the, and the Canadian football league and NFL Europe level in every level of pro football, the hardest thing to keep, is all of the egos and all of the agendas and all of the careers and all of the, you know, I guess ego is the best word I can come up with inside the building, all going in the same direction. And 
you know, it's constantly a battle for positioning and power. And, you know, it's that's endemic with the business. Right. And so there there should there must have been certainly something going on in that building. And, you know, it's loser out. That's the way it is in this business. You know, you lose a power struggle. You're going to be down the road. We saw it happen in Philadelphia. Right. When when Chip Kelly and, and uh, Howie Rossman had their you know power struggle and then you know rossman was able to come back in the building and has now built the eagles to what they are today it's it's going to be remain it's going to be interesting to see what happens now with this does mike get now the general manager and head coach responsibility which is what bill belichick has in new england and he is a belichick guy he played in new england he you know he learned football uh from coach Belichick and he learned, you know, I'm sure he learned structure from coach Belichick. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to see what Mike does in terms of what direction he's going to go in. Will he have a general manager? Will it be a general manager in name only? And he'll do all the you know decision-making, but you know, I guarantee you the, the AJ Brown deal wouldn't have been done. If this is, if this had been, you know, a year ago today. <laughs> I watched his reaction again earlier on Rabel's reaction when 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 Brown was traded and it just it was almost like it was that was it there and then it was just waiting for that moment it's incredible Jeff just to watch it back again just look, you know, you've been very very did generous you, my, hmm? Mike, did you did you notice the embrace that he and Vrabel had at the Eagles Titans game the other night yes it was I mean, intriguing yeah it, you could see you could see that those two guys have great respect for one another and great admiration and love for one another. And, you know, that had to have been one of the key factors in that decision. I'm intrigued to see what the Titans are going to do in the off season. That, that, that's going to keep me going in all these cold months in uh, seven or eight weeks. Just got one final one for you, Jeff. You've been very, very generous with your time as always. And a massive, like, man, I really appreciate it at this time of the day as well. And you're a busy man. Look, Everyone's sitting here talking now about the MVPs and who's going to win the NFC, the AFC. Is there one team out there at the minute that nobody's talking about that you think is going to make a push late into the season? Or is there one team that stands out to you, Jeff? Well, I think, you know, the team right now that to me is getting to be a scary football team is the Cincinnati Bengals because they are trending in the right direction and they're starting to get healthy. You know, Mike, in pro football, one of the things you say, you, you know, you, you, you actually divide the season up into, you know, segments, right? So if you're playing a 16-game schedule, which is what the N N N NFL was, you talked about playing in four-game seasons. Like the first quarter was the first four games. Then there was the second quarter, the third quarter, the fourth quarter. And you wanted to be just like in a game. You wanted to be playing your best football in the fourth quarter. Well, we're almost now into the fourth quarter. So the teams that will get hot from here on in, and that's why I mentioned Cincinnati, I thought they played extremely well the other night and beat a good, a really good Kansas City team. You know, Joe Burrow is 3-0 and against the Chiefs. Now, I don't know if anybody else can say that with Patrick Mahomes at quarterback. And so I think that's a team, you know, the Cowboys, you know, I, I'm always leery about the Cowboys because they, they, they break your heart every year. Right. But I think the Cowboys and the Eagles, I think those are two very good teams in, in that division. Um, the Niners took a hit now this week because of the quarterback situation, I was ready to anoint the Niners as the next, you know, the team, one of my favorites, mm. but I'm not sure I'm ready to go that direction right now. But I think it's interesting that there are a number of teams when you get into single elimination football, which is the National Football League playoffs, when you get into single elimination football, boy, it, you know, all it takes is a bounce of the ball, an official's call, uh, you know, a, a momentary lapse of concentration by a player and the whole thing is over, right? So that's why we love this game so much. And, and this that's why I love coming to Sky at what we call the business end of the season, because that's when the stakes are highest. Right. And if 
you know, I used to live in Vegas and I used to love to go to the craps tables when, you know, when the big money was on the table, right? <laughs> I, I look forward to seeing you at one of those tables next February for the Super Bowl in 2024, <laughs> Jeff. Um, here, seriously, come on. Thank you for doing this at short notice. And for, for anyone listening, Jeff should please go be back over in the UK, Ireland, Europe soon at Jeff underscore Reinbold. Do check out uh, Jeff's podcast uh, at least once a week. Coffee. Well, I was going to say coffee with coach, the Jeff Reinbold show. And Jeff, uh, thank you so much for coming on the Green Iron Show, man. I'll chat to you soon. It's my pleasure. Tell everybody back there I said aloha. 